Welcome to Church Online. Hello, everyone. Great to have you with us. Today, we're continuing our sermon series, Encounters with Jesus. We've been looking at people in the Bible who had life-transforming encounters with Jesus. Okay, let me get this right out on the table. Most people find today's encounter the strangest. Jesus is going to do a miracle in the strangest way. Most people look at this miracle and they walk away scratching their heads. Jesus, yeah, the miracle is nice, but the way you did it was just so weird. But here's what we've been seeing with these encounters. Each encounter shows us something about God's heart. Each encounter shows us something new about God's heart that's important for you to know. Today's encounter is no exception. Even the strange way that Jesus does this miracle shows us something really important we need to know about God's heart. Let's take a look. But before we do, would you join me briefly as we ask God to bless this study of His Word? Father, we pray to You and we ask Jesus that You would come with Your precious Holy Spirit and be our teacher today. Open Your Word to our lives, God, and open our lives to Your Word. Use this time, God, in our lives for Your glory, we pray. Amen. Today's encounter is found in John chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. It says, As he, Jesus and his disciples, went along, they saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Ouch. This man is blind, not deaf. That had to hurt. The disciples are reflecting some of the flawed theology of their day. And what's really sad and tragic is it's a theology we can still find around today. The disciples are trying to figure out what causes this type of suffering in the world. Good question. Let's be honest, you and I probably have had that same question. We have spent entire sermons on this topic. But suffice it to say that the disciples aren't doing too well with it. They trust that God is good. Oh, that part's right. So they try to find another explanation. So they figure it must be because of a person's sin. So they ask Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They are basically making two mistakes. First, Suffering isn't always related to a person's sin. Sometimes it is. I mean, let's be honest. You and I know that there are times in our lives where we bring difficulties and suffering and consequences on our lives uh, because of our sin. Uh, sometimes it is related, but, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes very good people suffer. Secondly, this man was born blind, which means that he would have had to have sinned in the womb. How sinful can a baby be in the womb? I know some of you moms got kicked really hard from time to time, but, but really, how sinful can a baby be in the womb? Can an infant really be that evil? Okay, I'll, I'll admit, there have been some toddlers that I've wondered about. Uh, but a child in the womb? That was the theology of the day. Imagine the insults this poor blind man must have overheard over the years. So when he hears the disciples asked, Who sinned, this man or his parents? He must have been thinking, Oh brother, here we go again. But then he heard something he never heard before. A kind, loving, gentle voice answers, verse 3. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. This must be music to the man's ears. He must be wondering, who's this? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work 
of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus is saying, suffering isn't always related to a person's sin. But now that suffering is here, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to show the heart of God and to do the work of God. And if we want to display the work of God to this man's life, we better get at it. Because night is coming when no one can work. The disciples tried simple answers. We like simple answers and formulas. We don't like mystery in our relationship with God because then it requires faith and involves trust. Jesus is letting us know there are no pat answers for some of the perplexing things that happen in this broken and fallen world. In some way or another, we all are born marred by this fallen world. We all are handicapped in some way, but all of it. Each and every handicap that you and I have, God can use it uh, to show us His glory. Jesus shoots down the false theology of His day. Birth defects, incurable illnesses, natural disasters uh, can't always be pinned on a specific sin. They sometimes are just part of a broken, fallen world. Jesus is not only teaching his disciples correct theology, he's also teaching them new attitudes. They see suffering. The disciples ask, uh, who can I blame? Jesus asks, how can I help? Verse 6, having said this, he, Jesus, spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. This man is blind. He's not deaf. He can hear. So he's probably heard about Jesus healing others. Maybe he heard about Jesus healing blind Bartimaeus simply by speaking a word. And he's probably really excited because he hears that Jesus is right there, right near him. And he hears Jesus mention showing the glory of God in this man's life. He must be excited. I, I think Jesus is about to heal me. And the next sound he hears is, well, I'll let you do that. Okay, everyone, take a moment and make the next sound that this man would have heard. And when you do, please, make sure that you're appropriately socially distant when you make that sound. It says, Jesus spit on the ground and then made some mud with the saliva. Here at Living Word Church, we try to be as biblical as possible. And as much as we can, we try to pattern our ministry after the style and the manner of Jesus' ministry. But I don't think we're ever going to try this one. In fact, I can assure you of that. We are never going to try this one. So the next time you come and visit, don't be afraid to ask for prayer for healing. The man hears that sound, and then he feels something wet. It's probably a good thing that this man couldn't see, because he probably would have said, Hey, buddy, you're not thinking of putting that in my eyes, are you? Verse 6 says, Having said this, he, Jesus, spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. Huh? Spit and mud. Why did Jesus do this? Didn't I tell you? Most people find this miracle the strangest. Why did Jesus use spit and mud? It's not like God needs spit and mud to do a miracle. People have come up with several possible explanations. First, the historian Tacitus tells us that at this time, 
people, especially pagans, believed that there was medicinal properties and qualities in spittle and mud. So people say that here, Jesus, in using spittle and mud, shows the fact that sometimes God honors medicine and uses medicine when he heals us. Sometimes God does use medicine. So whether he heals us by using medicine or a doctor or mud or, or nothing at all, ultimately, he's the healer and all the glory goes to him. Other people point out that Jesus, by using dirt, is reenacting creation. What did God use to create Adam and Eve? Dirt. So here Jesus is using dirt to recreate new eyes for this man. Note that he's not restoring this man's sight. This man has never seen. Jesus, God the Son, is simply doing what he did at creation. In this case, Jesus is taking dust of the earth and recreating his original design. We might say that, in effect, Jesus is proving to them that he's one in the same as God, their creator. We might say he's proving that he's the spitting image. Other people say Jesus did this just to vary his methods. Have you noticed? Jesus did change it up from time to time. Sometimes he went and touched the person when he prayed. Sometimes he just spoke the word, a long distance healing. One time he spit and put his fingers in a man's ear. Here he makes mud and wipes it on the man's eyes. People say that Jesus deliberately did this because God doesn't want to be forced into our box. That he knows our tendencies to want to look for formulas and lean on formulas. We'd want to formalize it and package it. We'd get fixated on a methodology rather than just leaning and trusting on the Lord. Soon we'd be leaning on the method rather than on the Lord. Soon we'd become the first church of, here's mud in your eye. A miracle happens. Well, how did that happen? Well, I noticed that when the sister prayed for that person for healing, she didn't just say amen. She said, amen. Oh, really? Yeah, she didn't just say amen. She said, amen. Well, I think when we pray for healing, then we all better say, amen. <laughs> so people say that Jesus deliberately changed it up so we wouldn't get tempted to trust a certain method. We would always be forced simply to trust in God. May we never become a church that trusts more in methods and programs and forgets how much we desperately need God. Other people point out that by rubbing mud on the man's eyes and then asking him to go wash, Jesus is inviting the man into the miracle. Sometimes Jesus invites us into the miracle. Jesus is giving this man something to do. Jesus is simply reminding us that this is often the way he works. He invites us into the miracle. Yes, I will set you free, but I want you to go and join that 12-step group and wash the mud off there. Yes, I will be your provider, but you have a problem with overspending. So I would like you to make a budget and stick to it. Uh, wash some of the mud off there. Jesus gives this man something to do. He's reminding us, write this down in your Bible. Sometimes Jesus invites us into the healing process. At this point, the man doesn't have much choice does he? After someone wipes mud and spittle on your eyes, guess what? You have to go and wash. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Thanks. I guess I have to. Now, don't I? Jesus 
was helping the man to be obedient. Sometimes we need a little motivation. Or shall we call it motivation? I should have gotten involved in that 12-step group in the first place. But now that my life has become a lot messier and muddier, I guess I have to. God, I thought things were bad before you started working in my life. <laughs> now they seem even messier. Sometimes it can feel that way. But don't misinterpret the mess and the mud. Sometimes God uses the mud. There's a message in the mess. There is meaning in the mud. Maybe God's inviting us into the miracle. Verse 7. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Isn't that simple? He went, he washed, and he came home well. He did what Jesus said, and he was healed. Imagine the scene. The man stoops down at the pool of Siloam to wash. He begins washing the mud off his eyes. And all of a sudden, he begins to see a glimmer of light. He's never seen light before. And his eyes begin to see. And he's amazed at the wrinkles around the knuckles of his fingers. And water. He's never seen water before. It's clear. It glimmers and sparkles. He looks up at the crowd around the pool. Life becomes a feast of vision. He look, the sky is blue. He sees billowing clouds racing across the sky. Beautiful. He gets to go home. He has always had to go home feeling his ways on trees and buildings and tapping with his stick. Now he can see. There must have been moments when he stopped and stood silently just to look down at the face of a child, tears streaming down his cheeks. Other times he was jumping and shouting with joy, hey look, a sparrow! Verse 8, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. Many of his neighbors share his joy. But others are so stunned by the magnitude of the miracle that they doubt. The man is shocked. Yes, it is me. Take a look. Uh, oh, great. Now I can see, and now you're blind. This day becomes completely different than any other day in this man's life. His world has utterly changed. He's been hearing the voices of his neighbors for years. Now he sees what they look like. He's putting faces together with those voices. Verse 10. How then were your eyes opened, they demanded. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. I don't know. I've never seen him. I was blind when he sent me. I wouldn't know him from Adam. This man is no doubt still in awe, in enjoying the wonder of vision, and his neighbors are peppering him with questions. Verse 13, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, well, then this man is not from God, 
for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. The man's neighbors rush him to the religious leaders. They're probably expecting the religious leaders to be excited and pull out the party poppers. But instead, the miracle becomes controversial. Have you ever noticed Jesus is always controversial? Verse 17. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. In other words, he's siding with those who believe Jesus is from God. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? They bring in the man's parents. Verse 20. We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. They throw their son under the bus. He's of age. Ask him. He, he can speak. He just couldn't see. They are afraid. Fear. The Bible says the fear of man is a trap. It says they're afraid they would be put out of the synagogue. Perhaps that doesn't sound so bad, but scholars tell us that that was an official term meaning complete religious and social excommunication. That was very serious business in those days. Our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world understand this a lot better than we do because they are experiencing it right now. It still happens. You become a pariah. You are no longer accepted as a part of your community. Not only are you not welcome at the community place of worship, but you also lose your job. No one wants to do business with you. It is such a harsh treatment. It was so severe that historians tell us that it was extremely rare back then because of how brutal it was. So that shows us just how angry these religious leaders have become. Your own family cuts you off. Many of our brothers and sisters around the world are facing this very same type of retribution because of their love and commitment to Jesus. Verse 24. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man, meaning Jesus, is a sinner. Give glory to God, they say. Scholars tell us that this was actually a formal oath formula that they're putting this man under a solemn oath. And it would mean that you are saying that what I'm saying, I'm saying before God. And if I am lying, I'm inviting God to condemn me to eternal damnation. <laughs> this is serious. Verse 25. He replied, whether he, Jesus, is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. I love this guy. He, he keeps it so simple. Poor guy. He was having such a great day. And now he's being grilled in theology by schooled religious leaders. His answer is classic. I don't know all the answers to your deep theological questions, but try this one on for size. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. 
Never underestimate the power of your simple testimony. Sometimes the, the most powerful, effective witness to those around us, our own personal experience with the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ. That's really all we need to know to be an effective witness. Whatever you want to do with him, that's up to you. All I know is I was blind and now I see. Or in the words of the chosen, I was one way and now I'm completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. For a long time, uh, almost every Saturday, members of a cult, the Jehovah's Witnesses, would come knocking on our door and they'd want to talk theology. So we would invite them in. We like talking theology. And we would talk theology, but my wife and I made sure we always included one other thing, a simple testimony. Hey, I know who Tim Barnes was. He tried so many things this world had to offer, and nothing could transform him or fulfill him like Jesus Christ. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. This man is a great example. We can begin telling others immediately. Often we feel like we're not adequately prepared. But if you've been touched by Jesus, you already know so much more than the lost of this world. They are wandering clueless in the dark. You have Jesus. Just tell them your personal story. Verse 26. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? The man answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? I have told you already. I couldn't see. Obviously, you can't hear. Maybe he can heal you too. <laughs> Would you like to become his disciples too? Note that. Would you like to become one of his disciples too? What does that imply? This man's already there. Hey, I'm already there. This is the third time you've asked me about this. You must be really interested in this. You must want to become one of his disciples too. <laughs> you can imagine these religious leaders getting ready just to scream, Ah! Oh! This guy is in a great place. What are they going to do to him? He used to be a blind beggar out on the street. Verse 28. Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now, that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. This man has only been saved for about an hour. And he beats these religious leaders in a theological debate. There he stands, a beggar, probably in shabby clothes, hair unkempt, maybe a little dirty. And he stands in front of these wealthy religious leaders wearing turbans and ornate robes. And he says, hey, you want to have a Bible study? Open your Bibles to Isaiah 35, 5. Uh, let me remind you what it says. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Healing of blindness was supposed to be one of the chief indicators of the Messiah. Or how about Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me 
to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. You remember, that's the verse that Jesus read in the synagogue the day that he launched his ministry. One day Jesus goes to church and he says, oh, let me do the scripture reading today. He reads that verse and he says, today in your hearing, that prophecy has been fulfilled. It's all about me. And here I am. So the man says, you're not sure where this man Jesus is from? Really? He opened my eyes. Do you remember earlier when I said that every one of these encounters is supposed to show us something important about God's heart? This encounter is no exception. But we could miss it if we're not careful. This is one of those times when context is so important. Today's encounter began, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth as he went along. This could sound so nice, like Jesus and his disciples are simply out taking a stroll when they happen to meet a blind man. Taking a nice stroll with Jesus. Doesn't that sound great? You in? But go back just one verse and we get the context. Look at the verse immediately preceding. John 8, 59. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. That's the context. Jesus is just narrowly escaping from an angry mob who wants to stone him to death. To say that things are heating up in Jesus' ministry right now would be a woeful understatement. What got them so angry with Jesus? Well, this is during the Feast of Tabernacles, very important eight-day feast in their calendar. People from all over the world would crowd into Jerusalem at this time to celebrate this feast. Jesus goes up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles, and he sort of hijacks the feast. During the feast, they have a water ceremony. The high priest takes a silver pitcher and leads a parade of all the people through the streets of Jerusalem to the Pool of Siloam. That means the pool of the sent one. In other words, the pool of the Messiah. The high priest dips the pitcher into the pool of Siloam and then leads the parade of all the people back to the temple where he pours the water at the base of the altar. The water signifies the coming Messiah. The high priest and all the people, they do this for seven days. However, on the eighth day, the greatest day of the feast, the high priest leads the parade. But this time he doesn't fill the pitcher. He leaves it empty, signifying that Messiah has not yet come. The Bible tells us that on that eighth day, the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stands in the center of the temple and says, If anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. Wow! Also, each night during the feast, they lit torches in the temple. Here again, Jesus stands up and shouts, I am the light of the world. All this gets him in trouble. There's a lot of static. And he gets into a heated debate with the religious leaders. It gets really bad. In fact, at one point, they even say some really nasty things about his mother. Yes, the Bible even has a yo mama moment in it. Toward the end of the debate, Jesus mentions Abraham. And the religious leaders say, you're talking about Abraham almost as if you knew him. You're not even 50 years old. And that's when Jesus makes the statement that pushes them over the top. 
John 8, 58. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. That is either really poor grammar or really great theology. Here's the great thing about God. He knows a lot of stuff, even the rules of grammar. So this is no accident. Jesus is deliberately using the personal name of God, the I Am, the great I Am name, the same name that God used from the burning bush when he spoke to Moses and said, I am. They know what Jesus is doing. He's deliberately equating himself with God, the same God that spoke to Moses from the burning bush. Which is why, next verse, at this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself slipping away from the temple grounds. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. See the context? The people who want to stone Jesus can't be very far behind. I would have been running for my life. But Jesus takes the time to notice someone. He notices a poor blind beggar sitting at the gate to the temple. I love this about Jesus. This is the Jesus we see all through the Gospels. Even during his toughest moments, he's never too busy to think of others. But wait. But this is so masterful. This is so beautiful. Look at the heart of God in this. Spit and mud. Why did Jesus use spit and mud so that this man would have to wash. Why did Jesus send him to the pool of Siloam? That's all the way across the town. There were many other pools that were a lot closer. He would pass many other pools along the way. Hey buddy, why don't you just wash right here in this pool? Why did Jesus do it this way? This could almost seem unkind, cruel for Jesus to do it this way. Except God is in it. God's heart. This is so beautiful. This is so amazing to me. Jesus is still trying to reach those who are persecuting him those who were just trying to stone him. So he sends them a living illustration, even while they are probably still chasing him. He stops long enough to send them a living illustration of who he is and what he came to do. Jesus rubs mud on the man's eyes. Spittle. He defiles the man. That means the man needs to be cleansed. So Jesus sends him not just to any pool, but the pool of Siloam, the sent one, the Messiah, all the way across town. That means this man has to grope his way all the way across town to the pool of Siloam. That means that he takes the same parade route that the high priest did. The high priest came back with his pitcher empty, but this man comes back seeing. Messiah has come. What did Jesus say about this man? That the work of God might be displayed in his life. The work of God. This man certainly would have gotten everyone's attention. This man is a walking illustration. This man is, is like a Jesus commercial. Undoubtedly a very strange sight. A blind man with mud caked on both eyes, making his way all through the streets of Jerusalem. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. He gropes his way through the streets of Jerusalem. People see him with mud on his eyes, feeling his way, touching the walls or 
tapping his cane as he goes through the streets, wearing the, the clothes, the tattered clothes of a beggar. And he washes in the pool of Siloam, and he's healed. Then the man excitedly returns back that same parade route, and he's seen. He's dancing for joy. Hey, everyone, look! A sparrow! Yeah, you've never seen a bird before? No! Jesus said that the work of God might be displayed in his life. This man is a Jesus commercial. Jesus could have healed this man instantly. But he is still trying to reach the people who were persecuting him. He said to them at the feast, I am the light of the world. If anyone follows me, they will no longer walk in darkness. This is such a beautiful demonstration of the love of God. These people shake their fist at him. Jesus is still trying to reach them. These people picked up stones wanting to stone him. Jesus is still trying to reach them. He deliberately sends them a powerful, beautiful, living picture of who he is. This man, that is me. That is you. Before we come to Christ, groping our way through the darkness of this world, lost in our sin, unable to find our way to God, we were lost in our blindness and sat there begging. Begging from the things of this world, but nothing could truly fill us. Blind, like this man, we wouldn't have known it if Jesus just simply had walked by. But grace reached down. Jesus cared enough to reach down and enter our world. Do you need to have an encounter with Jesus today? Are we ready to have Jesus reach into our world? Are we willing to allow him to do it his way? Maybe he'll use mud. Are we ready to say, Jesus, do it the way you need to do it. Do whatever you need to do for me to see your miracle working power in my life. Do what you got to do. Bring the mud. Those are not easy prayers. That might mean that sometimes God will allow a little mess and mud in our lives. Are we okay with that? Would you pray with me? Father, we trust you. And, and we're saying, God, from the depths of our heart, Lord, do whatever you need to do that we could see the miracle working power of you in our lives, Jesus. That you will touch our lives in such a way that when people see us restored from our mud and mess and blindness, that they will know that it is you who has done a great work in our lives. Use our lives for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. May God bless you.